Hello everyone and welcome back to another technical unobtained episode. In this episode I'm going to be showing off how I got all of the illegal blocks that are available in Minecraft 1.12 and I'm going to show you guys how I obtained those. So let's get right into it because it's a bit complicated. So the very first thing I need to explain is uh, block state palettes. This will all make sense in a bit but seems kind of strange to start here with the explanation but I've tried around a bit and this seems like the most logical order. So block state pilots, what are they? In each sub chunk uh, of a chunk, uh, a sub chunk is a 16 by 16 by 16 area uh, so that's a small, uh, smaller cube sized um, piece within a chunk that's the unit in which blocks get stored in Minecraft. So each uh, subchunk has a way to store particular blocks. And there are different ways to store these blocks to make it as efficient as possible to store uh, as many different kinds of blocks within uh, one chunk. Or if there are only very little blocks in one subchunk, for example, one filled entirely with air, you shouldn't waste too many um, storage space on storing that so that's why there are these different pellets if there are very few uh, block states in the pellet then we have a linear pellet type uh, if there are 16 through 256 there is a hash map pellet uh, type and when you have more than 256 you have the registry pellet type so the more block states you enter into a chunk the more bits each individual block state will take up in a subchunk. This is important because uh, in order to get unobtainable block states such as command blocks or barrier blocks or bedrock blocks in invalid places, you need the registry palette. So you need to put a lot of different block states over 256 within one chunk. So uh, 16 by 16 uh, area is uh, 256 block states and then the iron blocks below here or the redstone blocks uh, count up to 257 and then it's the different um, registry palette. So uh, if you build all of this within one subchunk you get the registry palette of a type of saving blocks in that particular subchunk. So how does this block state storage with the registry palette work particularly? Um, well, the block IDs along with the data values get stored in these long arrays. And um, because of the amount of blocks that exist in the game, uh, each block ID takes up 13 bits of which the lower nine bits are the, or the upper nine bits are the blocks uh, themselves and then the lower four bits are the state the block is in. So for example a stair has different states depending on how it's turned. Um, but as you can see 64 is not divisible by 13 so sometimes a, a block, a, a single block can get stored across multiple longs. So just um, a bunch of ones and zeros are stored in this long and some are stored in this other long. This doesn't seem like a problem because there uh, are always um, a number of blocks in a chunk, uh, in a sub chunk, which is divisible by 64. So you never get an empty long. So it shouldn't be a problem, right? Well, um, Let's check out what happens when the game sets a block at the position. So first of all, uh, this is just a normal block. Uh, you place an anvil. Um, the row of uh, bits gets read. Uh, then the bits are changed and then they're written back. And uh, same goes for a block that's placed over here. First long gets read. First bits get placed into the first long gets written back, second long gets read, uh, the remaining bits that have not been written yet get written into this long, and then the long is written back uh, into memory. But if you have 
two different threads running at the same time, these two different threads can write to the long array and they can interfere with each other, which is what I'm going to show now. So imagine on the first thread, uh, we place an anvil. Uh, then the first thread reads this long. It uh, uh, reads this long and then um, some other time later, an observer gets placed by this second thread. Then the second thread uh, edits its long and then the first thread is done and writes its long back and then the second thread writes its long back and now part of the bits of the anvil are turned to zeros because the second thread didn't know about it yet. If you don't understand what threads are yet, I'll explain it later. So what happens is uh, some bits um, get written into the second long and then the block that is placed at this position, the anvil, turns into a block which has um, the upper nine bits just be one and the lower four be zero. So that's the block with block ID one, which is stone. So this anvil isn't an anvil at all. It's in fact a stone block and then it turns into a stone block. So using these same mechanics with cutting off and combining bits with each other, we can get any block. So the first four bits uh, with the letter nine bits of, uh, so the first four bits of an anvil and the letter nine bits of water can be combined into the bits of a command block. But um, unfortunately, this has a low chance of occurring. So we need to get it to work um, so to get it to work, you need to attempt it a few hundred times. So um, how the challenge is now, Minecraft isn't multi-threaded. We don't have this observer or this second thread changing stuff um, at another time. So we can in theory do this, but how do we get a second thread in the game to um, change uh, blocks in the world? And that's what we're going to get into now. So this method to get uh, these multiple threads in your world is called um, generally async observer exploits or threadstone, which is a play of words uh, combining redstone and multi-threading. So um, to start out with, this threadstone is only available in uh, Minecraft versions 1.8 through 1.12.2. So um, don't go asking in the comments if it's possible in 1.21 because it isn't. Um, in this video, I'm going to be using 1.12.2 because that's the version I'm already in and uh, don't want to downgrade. And I'm going to be using a particular method of getting these async observers called Void's synchronized method. So um, shout out to Void. He is, I believe, a Chinese technical Minecrafter who discovered this uh, rather simple method of getting asynchronous observer lines, which I'm going to explain in a bit. And uh, further credits go to Myron in the Threadstone Discord because he um, helped me out a lot with uh, different problems I had while running this contraption. And he generally just knows a lot about uh, Threadstone. And uh, I'm not going to be talking about the history of the async observer exploits because there have been different methods discovered before this uh, particular synchronized method but I'm not going to be going over them in order to keep the video uh, as short as possible, but still going to be really long, but as short as possible. But that history is available on the Threadstone wiki, so um, you can find that in the description probably. So uh, I'm going to be giving a general overview, and if this sounds like gibberish, you don't need to worry. So. When a stained glass block gets placed or broken in the world, it will start a new thread to check for beacon blocks under it and change the color of beacon beams. This causes inspections to blocks uh, of the world to happen on a thread parallel to the main thread. And under special conditions, this may load a chunk on the beacon thread and cause terrain population to occur on the beacon thread. So if this sounds like gibberish, uh, you have to listen to uh, the explanation I'm going to give next. 
So first, let's start with an explanation of threads. We know we need uh, multi-threading in order to uh, get block state corruption to work. So we can use that to get our illegal blocks in the world. But what is multi-threading precisely? Well, Minecraft is usually single threaded. So uh, first I'm going to show how single threaded code works. So for example, powering a redstone wire in games, in the, in the game, first of all, you uh, turn on a lever and that lever gives out block updates. So this redstone wire here is um, receiving a block update. In reality, it's a bit more complicated, but uh, I'm simplifying here. So the redstone line receives a block update. Then when uh, that's done realizing that it's got a block update, it has to check if it is actually powered. And it realizes it is powered because this lever it, next to it is turned on and then it changes its power level to 15. And then uh, this redstone wire goes and updates blocks around itself and this redstone wire is updated. It checks if it needs to be powered and it turns on uh, power level 15, etc. If you have um, multiple threads, it means that these operations aren't just in one line. So you need to imagine this is some time and then uh, a couple of microseconds later this happens and then this happens and then this happens and so forth. But multiple threads means that you have multiple um, like cores in the CPU uh, calculating processes simultaneously and in uh, changing the world simultaneously. So you have multiple of these lines of operations following each other running at the same time and they can also be influencing each other because they're both running in the same world essentially. So uh, as I said usually Minecraft is single threaded but the exception is beacons because breaking or placing stained glass block creates a new thread. And this thread is created in order to investigate whether or not a beacon is below this glass block and if it needs uh, changing its color. Because when you place stained glass, obviously the beacon beam might change its color. Um, so for some reason, some dev added this in 1.8 and it has no particular reason because um, it could also just be made single threaded like everything else in the game. So as you can see, uh, this is the piece of code responsible um, on the downloader executed thread. So on uh, another thread that already exists in the game, um, this piece of code will be run. So it's kind of weird because this code does no downloading and no executing, but it's run on that thread anyway for some reason. And then um, let's take a closer look at this because um, it doesn't sound like that's that useful for us because we need block changes to happen in the world and these threads only check blocks and they never update or change any blocks in the world so we can't get our block state corruption to work, right? Well, do they really? Because if we can get a beacon thread to populate a chunk somehow we can get block updates because when a chunk is populated, it places these, it has a chance to place these waterfalls, which send out block updates. And these can be observed with observers. And then we can just make a long line of observers and um, use these block updates, right? Well, then we have changed the problem in uh, getting a beacon thread to populate a chunk. And that's not that easy because as you can see, uh, if you have stained glass, it only checks blocks below itself. So even if it's next to, next to a chunk border, it won't load the chunk next to it in order to uh, change uh, or check any blocks there. So generation can, in theory, never happen on a beacon thread, right? Because it is not going to happen if it's going to execute changes in its own chunk and in order to start changing that chunks need need to be loaded right but luckily generation is weird in 1.12 and um, 
that's what I'm going to explain next. So population in 112 can be abused for our goals because um, when a chunk gets generated, it will be at first unpopulated and it does not generate all trees and structures and those waterfalls I talked about before. That That's what uh, populate means. But when a two by two grid in the positive X and Z direction is um, loaded, then the center square within that two by two of chunks uh, mostly will be populated. So trees will be placed there and spawners and ores and of all of that kinds of stuff. Um, the thing is, um, update suppression exists. Um, so if a player action causes a chain of several thousand block updates, then the block of the chain terminates, but the game continues running as normal. So that's actually very useful for us. And now I'll show an, uh, update suppression in action real quick. So update suppression is fairly well known in the community at this point, but to be thorough, I'm going to show it off anyway. Um, so what happens is uh, with update suppression, um, too many uh, operations happen at once essentially, and that can allow some operations to not be processed. So if I break this iron block, then um, it first, uh, the iron block is broken. Then first the rain, uh, rail to the side here is updated, which then updates this rail and this rail and this rail uh, all the way through until it reaches uh, this place here where there's just a ton of rails. So all of these rails uh, are updated before um, this comparator is updated. And because there are so many rails, the uh, update chain terminates, uh, essentially a, a sort of small crash happens in the code, and then this uh, comparator here does not get updated. And that means that it stays floating here. But this can also happen in other parts of the code, which is what we'll use to get invisible chunks. So this update suppression can actually be used in a chunk population, which is what I'm going to show next, because it can be used to create invisible chunks. So when a chunk gets loaded, it first tries to populate itself and then tries to populate the chunks adjacent to it in a negative X and Z direction. Because um, if, for example, this chunk is loaded for the first time and these chunks are loaded, then these should also be populated um, because the two by two of chunks is loaded, right? Well, if you update suppress the population of a chunk, it will not try to populate the adjacent chunks. So let's check out what happens. It tries to, uh, a chunk gets loaded, is unpopulated, it will try to populate itself. So it's populated. And if we use that population to cause an update suppression, then um, these three chunks, which should now be populated because the two by two grid in the positive X and Z direction is loaded, does not get populated because this is update suppressed and the piece of code that needs to be run in order to um, populate these chunks actually never gets ex executed. So we can get fully loaded chunks, which are unpopulated. And these unpopulated chunks are invisible because they are not sent to the client by the server or the internal so server. And I've shown this behavior before in uh, episode six of this series. So if a chunk in the positive X or Z direction of these chunks is reloaded, they will be populated. So if either of these three chunks is um, reloaded somehow, then the check is run again for population in the negative X and Z direction. And these chunks uh, will get populated and they might actually place liquid pockets. So now we have changed the problem from generating or populating chunks on the beacon thread to reload a chunk on the uh, asynchronous beacon thread to get the thread to make block updates. Because if we reload a chunk, we can also populate a chunk that's next to it and is invisible. And then we can uh, 
get it to place a water source and that water source gives block updates which we can send into observers and that's actually another special case um, and using chunk safe stating we can get these uh, invisible chunks to work mul multiple times uh, we don't need to use new chunks every time because we just save state them as ungenerated or unpopulated for example and then we can use that to get um, asynchronous observer lines multiple times so now i need to explain instant tile ticking and instant folding because these uh, are actually quite important for uh, the exploit we're going to use because when a liquid pocket is placed into the world um, a global flag called instant tile ticking is enabled to make it look like it was done flowing before you arrived in chunk so liquid pocket get pla gets placed in a wall and then it needs to flow instantly down because otherwise you fly into the chunk and you see a waterfall flowing down as if it wasn't there before and it needs to look like it was always that way of course so um, this flag is activated and the instant falling flag is enabled to prevent you from seeing sandfall so whenever the population of a liquid pocket is suppressed um, just like how the population of the chunks in the negative x and z direction is cut off is not handled the processing of the disabling of these two flags is also not processed it's also cut off by the suppression which means that these flags these instant tile ticking and instant falling flags will be on all throughout the world so what do these flags do precisely is uh, the question now and i'm going to show you that in the next clip okay so now we're going to be explaining the instant falling flag and the instant uh, tile tick uh, flag so first of all everything's normal i've uh, disabled nothing uh, yet and sand falls normally but um, when running these carpet commands, which I'm just using to show it to you guys easily, um, I can turn both of these flags on. And um, now, as you can see, everything happens instantly, essentially. So all of the tile ticks gets processed instantly. Same goes for sand. Um, the second it is placed, a tile tick is placed on it uh, to start falling and that's instantly uh, processed and then it falls uh, down uh, because of the instant falling flag. If you have both of these flags en enabled, you can uh, create a um, device like this, which are super simple sand dupers, which use um, the TNT duping mechanics to quickly um, duplicate sand. As you can see, works very well. And then um, you can also uh, very easily update suppress using this because if you have a dispenser with a water bucket in it, um, if you bud it and then break a block next to it, it will update suppress. So it's uh, then it powers and then it will update suppress because um, the water bucket is placed and then it already sends out updates to this dispenser which is turned on and uh, the water bucket hasn't been removed yet and then it plays the water block update and so forth until it just um, updates the presses so as you can see a lot of uh, water placing sounds and um, remove the water again and now if we reactivate it because the water isn't gone yet we can also do stuff like this and um, the most important case for us is uh, the case with observers so if I place a block in front here nothing happens at least seemingly nothing happens but in reality a lot of stuff does happen so um, what's going on here well let's do the example with one observer first so you place a block it turns on and then it schedules a tile tick to turn on uh, turn off and then that gets executed instantly and it turns off right away again but what happens when you have two observers well then this one turns on it sends out block updates this one realizes oh something changed 
I need to turn on 2 and then it turns off and then only then does this one turn off again and then this one turns on and off again so it essentially doubles the block updates each time so how that works is first observer uh, has two changes because it turns on and off second one has four on off on off next one eight uh, then 16 32 64 128 and so forth just the powers of two so if you have um, not that long uh, observer line you can create quite a lot of lag but my PC is quite good so if um, this final observer will do uh, 8192 and this 16384 let's see if it lags uh, not visibly okay let's add just a few more well seems like uh, quite a lot of block updates can happen so now you can see um, when I break one the timer freezes for a bit and then speeds up right after So that was quite a lag spike. So um, this is important for us because um, from one block update, from the waterfall flowing down, we can essentially get infinite block updates through just making the observer line longer. But you need to watch out when instant falling uh, or instant tile tick is on because you can get a lot of block updates real quickly and if you accidentally uh, activate this on the main thread it can crash your server so let's now take a look at um, how the setup i'm going to use works precisely so how does the setup work um, because we still have the problem of needing to reload the chunk on the beacon thread so this is a problem because it's hard because the beacon thread will only check a couple hundred of blocks before terminating because it only searches downward and you can of course have no more than 256 blocks in a column in minecraft because that's the world height in 1.12 so even if the chunk uh, and another problem is that even if the chunk the beacon thread is in is scheduled to be unloaded um, for example, because a player is walking out of it or the autosave uh, hits, um, then the beacon thread will just continue checking blocks because it's of course running on another thread. And when it checks such a block, the scheduling of the unloading of the chunk is cancelled, meaning the chunk will not be unloaded. And we need to unload the chunk in order to be able to reload it and cause the population. And that is where the core of the synchronized method comes in, because using one uh, single trick, we can actually um, get rid of both of these issues, that the thread terminates very fast and that it um, cancels the unloading of the chunk. Because um, there is something interesting when adding um, a scheduled task, if we chase down all of the calls in the code so first of all we have the add scheduled task runnable that's called uh, when we um, make the beacon thread and then we go to minecraft server add scheduled task and then um, and it minecraft server call from main thread which is called here we see this this synchronized block and this is very important um, because it means that if there are multiple threads actually trying to go through this um, block um, because um, it, it is it not the main Minecraft thread, uh, it is not because it's a beacon thread and the server is still running, then it goes through this piece of code which is the synchronized block and if there are multiple threads trying to run this code at the same time um, they can't because only one thread can run this code at the same time so if we have one thread going in 
only when it's out again can another thread get in. And all the threads are just trying to get in here as fast as they can. And um, because there is another thread in here, most of the time they will fail. So if we create multiple beacon threads, this can actually create uh, a lot of time for us because um, when we create a lot of beacon threads, they will have to wait for each other in order to go through this block of code, which means that they can't actually um, uh, terminate because they're still waiting to run this code. So we can keep them alive for quite a while. And additionally, there is another synchronized block in the player code and this uh, synchronized block here makes it so that when you create the beacon threads in the player phase particularly they'll wait for processing for when the main thread is finished with that phase so if we have the player uh, create all the threads and then in the same tick move out of the chunk those uh, threads were created in or uh, our important thread is created in it will first unload the chunk and only then does the thread continue um, with its block checks and then it will reload the chunk. So because of this synchronized block here, the threads can stay alive for a while. And because of this synchronized block here, the chunk will actually unload um, because the thread can't do anything before the player phase is finished. And when the player phase is finished, the chunk will be unloaded. So. How does the setup work? Um, we need to, of course, do it in practice. Um, this table here shows all of the chunks uh, around the player. The green chunks are the chunks that are loaded by the player and the white chunks are unloaded. This T chunk is the target chunk, which we are going to try and reload using the beacon thread. This I chunk is the chunk we'll make invisible using the invisible chunk exploit so that when this target chunk is reloaded, this uh, invisible chunk will be repopulated or uh, place a liquid pocket on that asynchronous thre uh, thread. And this S chunk here is a suppression chunk uh, of which we need to suppress its population in order to create this invisible chunk. Okay, so uh, the first step is that we load a bunch of chunks around the suppression and invisible chunk. Um, and this is so, so that the suppression chunk actually has that valid two by two in order to uh, populate itself. And the invisible chunk also needs to be loaded in order to be able to become in, an invisible chunk. Uh, secondly, the suppression chunk uh, will be generated using a player action and then it will be uh, update suppressed its population so the uh, invisible chunk will not be populated because this suppression chunk's population is suppressed. Um, and now we'll go into a single tick uh, because a lot will happen at the same time here because all of uh, the following slides will happen in one singular tick. First of all, the player breaks 2000 glass blocks in some unimported chunk, could be this chunk or this chunk, it really doesn't matter. And um, he does this to create a large amount of threads that will delay the important thread, which will try and reload the target chunk. And because they all need to go through the same synchronized block. Uh, after that, the player moves and he schedules the unloading of a row of chunks, including the target chunk. So uh, first, all of these were just um, loaded, and then um, there will be scheduled to unload, and then uh, the player presses a button to reload all of these chunks. So only this chunk has to actually unload. And then in the very next tick, chunk is unloaded, and then the uh, beacon thread uh, can actually run again because the player phase is finished. And then the target chunk will be loaded on the beacon thread because the chunk it was previously in was unloaded because it was not actually doing any actions in this chunk uh, while the unloading of the chunk was going on. And this finishes the two by two grid here for um, 
the invisible chunk to populate and it will create an invisible uh, it will create um, a liquid pocket which we can observe using observers um, the block updates and we can use that to um, create uh, illegal blocks using word tearing as I showed in the first PowerPoint. So now we're at the place where it's all actually going to go down because this is the setup built up in my world. So um, you can see a bunch of concrete wires with different colors and uh, let's go over them one by one. Um, you need to imagine this is kind of the chunk table we have over here and uh, same things are going on here. So in this um, top left corner here, we have the blue line, which uh, the player activates uh, the fir uh, very first line, which loads chunks around the suppression chunk. And then we have uh, the purple line, which will actually populate the suppression chunk, which is right over here, or uh, it's actually over here. Um, so then, uh, this invisible chunks population will be suppressed uh, because of uh, this um, suppression chunk here places a water source over here which will flow down here and um, through this dispenser causes an update suppression while also uh, placing safe state books into these chunks on instantaltic. Uh, by the way, this setup was uh, designed by Void too, so um, I only made some minor changes in order to get it to work with render distance 16 instead of 10. Um, after that, we should go back. Um, so this lever and then that lever, because then we have created the invisible chunk. Then we'll go to lever 3, which will update uh, this observer here, which uh, as we have seen before, can create a large lag spike, and this is way more observers than shown in a video before. So this creates a very long lag spike of um, multiple seconds, so eight seconds or something. And that way we can um, press lever uh, this button number four here, and go through to the next chunk and press this button all within one tick. So this creates lag spike, then number four here is the blue wire, which goes all the way over to uh, this uh, chunk, which is the irrelevant chunk with all of the uh, stained glass and uh, dragon eggs on instant falling can break all of this stained glass. And because instant altic is on two, they will do so all within one tick and create a couple thousand of uh, threads. And then this is the target chunk, which will be reloaded and this was the invisible chunk. So when this chunk is reloaded, this chunk will be populated and create an async line because um, this green wire over here, by the way, is the chunk that re, uh, is the line that reloads uh, the chunks that don't need to be unloaded. So when the invisible chunk is populated, it places a liquid pocket right over here, which updates all of these reels, goes up which then reactivates its own save state. So it's save stated again. Wire goes over here, goes into some observers which go into a repeater line and then the repeaters go through and through and through. And eventually uh, after a fairly long distance, when they go through this wire all the way here, they uh, end up in here somewhere uh, where um, I will be doing my word tearing on order to get my um, illegal blocks. So let's try this setup in action. This yellow wire isn't important yet, by the way. It's always a bit nerve wracking when uh, trying this because um, this exploit doesn't have a 100% chance of working. So far, it has always worked on my PC, but uh, it can not work too. So I believe this time it didn't work, so I'll need to try again. 
so the reason it didn't work last time is because I didn't relog before doing this because relogging resets the player's position which has to do with chunk loading so if um, you relog your position is like right here um, for the chunk loading too and that uh, means that the moment I cross this chunk border here, the chunks in the back there actually get unloaded instead of um, not doing that. So it seems like it worked because the observers turned on this time. And um, now we need to walk over here in order to unload everything properly. This device over here, by the way, um, should be able to tell us if everything worked correctly. Yes, it's duplicating sand. As you can see down there. So that means that at least the um, save states um, activated properly. Okay. And then we go through the nether to the setup because it's in a very specific chunk, um, which I'll explain next episode. So it's over, um, I believe about a thousand blocks in the overworld. So that's um, through this portal. Because that chunk has some special properties as you can see, the observer line is pulsing over here. Um, on the async thread, that's why the game isn't actually lagging now, because this very fast pulsing is actually happening on another thread, so it doesn't lag at the other, the, the main thread. So this contraption is able to um, create barrier blocks here. And as you can see, I have already gotten a barrier block, but four blocks over in every chunk, there is um, another position in which you can create the same exact blocks. Because this has to do with the um, position in a chunk. Um, um, command chunk, I should set to true. And then we can use slash palette boss info. Uh, on this position, of course, and then we can see that these um, upper five bits and the lower um, other bits, the lower eight bits, are um, cut off between two longs here on this exact position. And uh, on, for example, the position where I created this um, structure block using fire and, block and black concrete power, um, the bits are cut off in another way. So if we use POS info here, you can see that there are six bits and um, the other bits. So it's cut off uh, different ways on different positions in the chunk, but they're cut off the same way if you move four blocks over. So this is one, two, three, four, and then they're cu cut off here in the same place. And then because this observer line um, will be pulsing, you can't um, see it right now because um, the packets of it pulsing aren't being sent right now. So um, right clicking on it does uh, send the proper blocks. So if I were to now um, update this piston, we can get this clock running and then eventually um, as it states here, iron thread door plus the moving piston block or the block 36 block can create um, the um, barrier block. There is uh, a few problems with this though because this uh, these observers can get stuck, can get stuck in the on state, and then they need to be broken and replaced. And this can happen because the word tearing can happen the other way around, so that the main thread actually replaces um, the observers here. Oh, so now the um, trapdoor just disappeared. 
or it turned into a dandelion, that can happen. And um, yeah, so on all of these particular positions, we have different uh, blocks. Uh, except for these two, I moved them over a bit because they uh, were created in the same position as some other block. So as you can see, over here is a dandelion because that's a side product that can be created by this uh, contraption. Okay. And I have a few other clips of uh, those blocks uh, being created. I believe the... Uh, Command block because that has a pretty interesting contraption. So um, I'll show those two and I'll just wait for this barrier block. Okay, so now the barrier block appeared and that's why the piston clock stopped. Um, in the F3 screen over here, we can see the barrier block. So um, that's how you can get these illegal blocks in your world. Um, by the way, you need to put those 257 block states in the same subchunk. So these blue lines indicate the subchunk borders. And if we go up here within the same subchunk, I have all of these blocks here, which um, form the pallet thing. And behind that sand wall is a spoiler wall, which we'll see next episode. And you can also create spawners using this and uh, different types of command blocks. Um, so that's all very interesting. And now I'll show you the clips of getting, I believe, this command block. I just went to the nether to turn off instant falling because this contraption needs instant falling to be turned off. Okay. And I got it first try, that's nice. So before doing the outro, I wanted to um, take a good look at all of these blocks and how you can get them. So, um, yeah, uh, first of all, this is the end gateway block. So this is different from an end portal block. And you can get it by combining some bits from water with frosted ice. Then uh, the next block we have here is quite uh, unknown. This is actually the structure void block, as you can see up here. It says structure void. This is a block that's used by uh, map makers or structure makers um, to um, make it so that no particular block is included in the structure so that the structure doesn't replace other blocks if there is a structure void block there. And you can make that one using uh, water plus frosted ice too. So you might think, well, that would make the same block, but that's because they're in a different position. So the some different bits are combined with each other. Over here is the barrier block using the iron trap door and the moving piston, just like that one we created over there. Um, here is the structure block, which is used to record structures. And if you click on it in survival, it changes shape for some reason, kind of weird. And the that one is created by uh, fire and black concrete powder. So it's created using the gravity blocks, just like how the command block is created. Then over here, we have a chain command block, which can be created using fire and end roots. So you just place uh, a bunch of end roots into a fire block, and then it works. Um, the command block, as we saw in the video, using water plus anvil. And these were both created using uh, different colors of carpet and a moving piston block on the same location. 
so uh, yeah I believe that was on the spawner blocks location and then over here uh, the re repeating command block which is used um, which is created using grass and grass path blocks so you um, have a shovel in your main hand and uh, grass in your offhand and you hold left and right click on this block while an uh, observer line is pulsing next to it and then we have the um, spawner which is fittingly created using moss stone and a moving piston um, and uh, of course you need an async observer line uh, next to it pulsing in order to actually get the spawner so i hope you guys like this episode as much as i like making it um i'm sorry it's probably going to be a bit long because there was just a lot of stuff that needed explaining uh, so I hope you guys have a better understanding of how all of these things work now. And um, if you have any questions, you can leave them in the comments. And if you're new here, um, please con uh, consider subscribing because I'm definitely going to continue uploading. So um, subscribe if you don't want to miss out on new videos. And um, of course, like if you like the video. Have a great day. Bye bye.